From Hoist Go with Hostages, Part 1. I'm going to try to give you as many details as possible so that you can get the picture. Number 8 began. Right, the prison in Huesco was used as a point of transit for prisoners being transferred from Barcelona to Madrid, and Madrid to Barcelona. I knew it as soon as they told me in Zamora that I was going to be moved there. I sensed that I would have many chances to get out of there immediately because it is a very old building. I arrived at Huesca at the beginning of April 1991, but I was transferred to Logroño 15 days later and returned to Huesca in July, just in time for my 28th birthday. It was the 12th birthday I'd spent in prison, and I got used to it. It didn't upset me anymore. I numbed my brain with a load of spliffs, and the day passed without joy or sadness, just like the last 11 years. The way I would have to escape from Huesca was so obvious and simple that I didn't bother to think about it. So I put all my energy into getting hold of everything I needed to prepare the escape. To start with, I gave myself a deadline of five months, which in which to carry it out. The 31st of December was the deadline for attempting to regain freedom. When I came back to Huesca in July, I shared a cell with Pepe, an old acquaintance from my area. Pepe is a great guy. Back in 1981, he escaped from the Modelo prison armed with a gun, and when he was recaptured six months later, he tried it again the same way and fell outside seriously wounded by two shots from a CETME. So as not to get him into trouble, I didn't mention the escape, which I imagine must have caught him completely by surprise. I sincerely hope that my escape didn't give him any problems. The months passed, and I still hadn't found the way to resolve the material problem of preparing my escape. I spoke to people, I sounded out willingness and possibilities, but nothing. People talk a lot, they take things on, but when the time comes to put their words into action, they melt like butter in the sun. Listen to the poet, number 10 joked. Shut up and don't interrupt. I'll go on. These people I was talking about are to be avoided at all cost. That's how things were going, where when in the month of August, they bring El Goreto, a junkie with a broken arm, to Huesca. I had met this guy in the prison of Logroño, so I went to look for him when I heard his name through the loudspeakers. I asked him about some mutual friends, and he told me how he had gained freedom the previous year. He had wandered in Catalonia and Aragon, between the house of some relatives in Zaragoza and that of his girlfriend's mother in Huesca. As soon as I heard this last bit, a spark lit up in my brain, and I asked him nonchalantly if that meant he had been living in Huesca. Yes, he said. My girlfriend is a sister of El Pirla. Their parents welcome me in their house no problem. Their mother is a well-known lawyer in that town. El Goreto also told me that he and his girlfriend were mixed up with shit, but both were determined to come off of it. Well, being determined to come off of it, as you know, is what 95% of junkies always say. So I stored all this information and changed the subject. Carlos, do you know a guy named Castillo, he asked. No, I answered. At least, I don't know anyone of that name. But I've only been here for a short time and don't know everybody. I'm asking you because I think a guy from my town with that surname is here, he explained. But I'm not sure if it's Manolo or his brother Enrique. Anyway, I'll find out. If I find out any more, I'll let you know, okay? I said without any intention of looking for this Castillo. El Goreto was on remand and had to go to his wing, so we said goodbye. The next day, we met again and he told me he had met the Castillo guy. He was in the canteen area and he pointed him out to me. He was in his thirties, with long hair, and a beard that looked as if he had never cut it in his life. He was dark-skinned, and I reckoned about 170 meters tall. Gradually, I told El Goreto my idea, without going into details, but leaving it so that he could guess what it was all about. El Goreto was released 10 or 12 days after his arrival. He left without saying goodbye, and as I needed his address, I went to speak to this Castillo, who was the one he'd hung out with while he was inside. This was the first time I'd spoken to Castillo, so I introduced myself and asked him if El Goreto had left any message for me. No, he said, observing me carefully. He came to say goodbye, but didn't leave any message. Have you got his Huesca address? I asked directly. I need to get in touch with him. No, he didn't give it to me, but we agreed that he'd write me <clears throat> from the outside, Castillo said, more relaxed. By the way, how about a coffee and a chat? Okay, I agreed, wondering what he's going to say. We went over to the counter, asked for a couple of doubles, then we took our plastic cups and started walking. What I'm about to say might upset you, but El Goreto talks too much. Castillo caught me by surprise. 
He told me about the favor you asked of him. What are you talking about? I asked, starting to get irritated. I don't know what you're getting at. I've known Algarito a long time, he continued. We're from the same village. I happened to ask him a favor, and when I mentioned it, he said I was the second person to ask him. That's when he pointed you out to me. But then I was really angry, even if I tried to hide it. So as naturally as possible, I said, I still don't understand what favor you're talking about. You're not being very clear. Seeing my reticence, Castillo, whose first name was Manolo, decided to get to the point and told me the favor I had asked of El Garito. It was exactly that. But don't worry, Carlos, Manolo Castillo reassured me. When I realized what a loudmouth that guy was, I made sure he was never away from me, so I took care to see that he didn't tell anyone else. I kept an eye on him until he was released. At that point, Manolo put his cards on the table. He told me how his ideas were similar to mine, and added that we would reach our goals more easily if we joined forces. From that moment on, Manolo and I grew closer by the day. We both had very clear ideas, and we got on perfectly. By mid-October, we had sorted out all the problems, especially concerning the mechanical and human material. We just had to wait for the right moment, which we reckoned would be at the end of December or the beginning of January. But in November, there was a kidnapping in Huesca prison. El Pirla, El Garreto's brother-in-law, was a protagonist. He had been arrested a few weeks earlier for killing a retired cop during a robbery. El Pirla worked in the football workshop next to the miscellaneous workshop, where I kept my easel and oil paints. He started off by kidnapping the screw in the football workshop, then taking the instructor screw, he came to our workshop and stayed locked in there alone, asking for ten grams of heroin, ten of cocaine, and a syringe. But he was recaptured in the space of a couple of hours and was severely beaten. The press was full of congratulations and praise for the governor and his screws. Praise poured down from all sides. The county commissioner, the prison directorate general, anonymous honest citizens, and so on. Everybody pointed to the jailer's decisive action in overcoming the kidnapper without the help of the police. I was disgusted by all of this, of course. All kinds of comments were being made in the yard. Manolo and I also talked about the episode, and once again we had the same ideas. We both agreed that, if necessary, we would do a kidnapping to escape, or die, taking them with us. We discussed a recent case in Germany, where four prisoners had escaped after showing that they were prepared to kill. It's obvious that those who show that they are prepared to use violence to the full are the ones that reach freedom. Another point is that, once outside, they blew their heads off. I'm of the opinion that you have to do things well, and then have a bit of luck for them to succeed. After the El Pirla kidnapping, we had to put up with the screws boasting about their good work for an entire week. And it was exactly ten days after the kidnapping that we learned, as we were leaving the workshop, that a guy who had once snitched on Manolo about an escape plan in this very prison had been transferred back. Logically, he wanted to kill him. Carlos, he said with a strange light in his eyes, that tyke is here. What do you want to do? I asked. Well, he said, we made a pact, so if you ask me not to take any notice of him, I won't. But what I really want to do is go to that wimp and kill him. I didn't think much about it. Basically, I was impatient. I wanted to act for fucking once, and it seemed to me that this was a good excuse. I'm not going to ask you to not do him in, but you know the situation. We should stake everything on our freedom and try to get it at all costs. If things go wrong, we must kill as many of them as possible before we fall, right? I put to my comrade. All right, Castillo agreed. Tonight we'll start the party in the workshop. And that's how we reached the decision. We didn't need to say much in order to understand each other, nor did we need to make any arrangements for our action. We had already discussed everything. But it was a shame that the arrival of the snitch pushed us to act on the spur of the moment, renouncing our beautiful escape plan. Calmly, in the silence of the night, and with a bit of luck, we'd have been gone before roll call without them noticing. In that case, they wouldn't have chased us with as much fury as they actually did. But the situation was urgent, and we had to make a decision one way or the other. And we did. We talked a lot about what we'd do, if necessary, to avoid making the mistakes of other kidnappings. We got to the point that when we got into the workshop that night, it just took one look. Are you ready? I asked him while we were having a coffee. Yes, and you? He questioned me. Of course. Let's go for that one, I answered eagerly, pointing to the screw. Without thinking twice, we went up to the screw who was walking around the workshop. We grabbed him, put the knife to his throat, and took him into his office, where we tied him on the floor with the string used for some sewing the footballs. His feet tied to his neck and his hands behind his back. He stayed there, unable to move an inch, out cold. Then we went down to the center and neutralized the head screw and three others. We surprised the four of them while they were chattering away. When we stood in front of them, armed with knives, they were aghast, with idiotic smiles on their faces. If anyone makes a move, 
I start cutting. I warned them. So sit down nice and calm. What's up, Carlos? The head of the center says. He was called Jesus, and I knew him from Daroca. Come on, let's talk. There's nothing to talk about. You can see for yourself what's happening. Behave so that blood won't be shed unnecessarily, I said point blank, without any respect. Then I turned to Manolo and told him to keep an eye on them while I went to the kitchen to get the big knives. Yes, but be quick, he said nervously. I assured him I would be back immediately, then, addressing the screw, said, Come on, give me the key to the kitchen. In the twinkling of an eye, I'd reached my objective and had the knife at the throat of the boss of the kitchen. Quick, where are the knives? Pale and speechless, the boss pointed to a drawer. I rushed to open it and chose five knives. Three of them had a blade 15 to 20 centimeters long, and the other two were 40 to 45 centimeters. They looked like swords. I came back to the center with the knives. I gave a small and a large one to Manolo. He went to get the screw in the yard and take him to the center. Then he went to get the teacher. The center was getting crowded with newcomers, and my comrade didn't stop recruiting new hostages. I'm going to get the screw we tied up in the workshop, he said. Okay, go and bring some football string to tie this lot up with when you're at it. But while Manolo was in the workshop, the gate opened and the screw in charge came walking towards the center. I was watching over the screws inside, and he was looking out to avoid trouble as they were not tied up yet. The door of the gate was behind me, and when I heard it opening, I turned towards the screw in charge. Unfortunately for him, he wasn't looking ahead, but at some papers he was carrying, so he didn't realize what was going on until he was past me. Start moving towards the center, I surprised him, making sure that the knife was well visible. But what? he seemed about to ask, gesticulating as if to protest. I stabbed him slightly in the chest, two centimeters above his right nipple. As soon as he realized he had been struck, he looked incredulously and ran to hide behind the central. I didn't run after him so as not to leave the entrance to the center unattended, and he ended up hiding in the kitchen. At that point, Manolo came down because somebody had told him what was going on. I explained the situation to him, and he went to get the head screw. The guy had locked himself in the kitchen, but came out when he heard the pathetic wailing of a screw on whose throat Castillo was holding a 40-centimeter long knife. Jose, open up! They're killing me! The screw moaned. Finally, the head screw put his head around the door, and we put him in the center, too. We already had seven hostages there, but Manolo went out again to get the screw from the workshop. Having had to rush down because of the way things were going, he hadn't been able to take him last time. This time, he took him but forgot the string. We decided to ask a mate to throw some down from the first floor. I noticed that a group of screws were watching the whole scene through a small window in the gate, so with a threatening look, I forced them to close the spy hole. Once the situation was under control again, we ordered the screws to tie themselves to each other. They complied, not having any choice, and we only had to tie the last one. After making sure they were completely blocked, Manolo took one of them to the point where he had decided to position ourselves. It was on the third floor of the center. Before going any further, we should point out that there was no cells or internal corridors on this level, only a couple of small storerooms and a corridor that went around the center. In the middle, there was a drop of 10 or 12 meters. It was an impregnable position, which couldn't be stormed without us first liquidating all of our hostages. Manolo went up to this look lookout point with a screw, and after tying a piece of string around his neck, attached him to the banister. He forced him to cross his feet, and after tying them together, he doubled the knot at his hands. As soon as he'd finished with the first screw, he asked me to send him another one, and repeated the whole tying-up ceremony. And so on to the last one, with whom I also went up. I got hold of two walkie-talkies, and once we'd done tying them up, we called the main gate. It must have been about five in the afternoon. From that moment, the psychological battle had begun. Our first contact was with another head screw, nicknamed El Pistolero. I was in charge of negotiations. Manolo just butted in at times to call them sons of bitches and other stuff like that. Who am I talking to? El Pistoletto asked. It doesn't matter who you are talking to, I answered. What matters is that you listen carefully, and more important, that you do as we say. What are you trying to achieve? For the moment, I'm putting you onto one of your colleagues so that he can explain the situation to you, but you can start contacting the county commissioner. Here is the guy in charge, Jose Sanz. I then passed the walkie-talkie to the guy, but before pressing the button, I warned him. Tell him what's going on and watch it. He nodded. I'm Jose San. Listen, they have eight of us up here, all tied up. It's a very tricky situation. I'm wounded, even if it doesn't seem to be too serious. There are two inmates, and they're armed with kitchen knives. Are you sure you're all right? El Pistoletto asked. I answered. Yes, he's fine. As soon as the commissioner arrives, get him to contact us. 
As for the governor, he'd better hurry up. Things will get very dangerous if we lose our temper, get it? The warden has been alerted and he's on his way. We're trying to contact the commissioner. He tried to calm me down. Right. I'm cutting off all communication until the warden gets here, I said, putting an end to the conversation. Then I turned to Manolo and asked him how he was feeling. He said he was feeling great. He was actually a bit excited, and every now and again would deal out a few slaps to the screws at random. All the same, he didn't miss anything. I liked his coolness and was happy to have such a comrade for an undertaking like this. Estebe, can you hear me? said a voice from the walkie-talkie. Yes, is that the warden? I asked. No, the voice replied. I'm the psychologist. Can we talk? Very well, smartass, I said, pretending to be very angry. Look here, just think. Between my comrade Manolo and myself, we've done nearly 30 years prison. Do you know what that means? What do you want, idiot? To psychoanalyze us? Or maybe you want to tell us a fairy tale? Get lost, motherfucker. The warden had better hurry up. Otherwise, the party's about to begin. The warden's coming right away, Esteve. The psychologist explained frantically. I just wanted to talk to you. There was a moment of silence, after which we heard a different voice. Esteve. Esteve, it's me, the warden. What is it that you want? We want to make a scene out there, I said. I assure you that I'm ready to authorize your transfer to hospital immediately, said the governor. I guess you didn't get it. We don't want to go to hospital. We want to go out, so find us a helicopter. No, that's impossible, he interrupted. All right, I said, pretending to agree reluctantly. We'll take a car, but don't say no. We've already accepted your refusal of a helicopter, and we won't accept any more. Do you get it? I shouted. Yes, I understand, Estive, but I need to hear from the Justice Department first. All right, I accepted. But meantime, we want to talk to the commissioner before half past six. Call us when you get news, but don't forget the deadline. I cut the communication and started to analyze the situation with Manolo. We were still in a state of controlled euphoria. We were well aware of the danger we were running into, given that we had no intention of surrendering following a negotiation. It was clear that we'd either achieve our goal, or we'd kill all of our hostages one by one. And we had eight of them. Every time I think about these moments, I'm always surprised by the lucidity, serenity, and clarity of mind we had at that moment, when life was hanging by a thread. Also, our hearts were pumping hard and the adrenaline was producing a pleasant sensation. We asked for water and some fellow prisoners brought us some bottles of it, coffee and cigarettes. They demonstrated their sympathy and solidarity with their action constantly. Cynicism was the order of the day. The same prisoners let us know that the lights in the yard, on the roofs and on the walls had all been switched off, and that a huge number of picoletos were positioning themselves on the roofs. It was now a quarter past six in the afternoon, so I called the main gate. Gate, can you hear me? Gate? Hurry up! Answer somebody! Yes, I'm the vice commissioner. Where's the commissioner? I asked. He's busy trying to get in touch with the governor in Madrid. Ah, uh, right. Are you taking me for an idiot or what? The governor should have been contacted and informed about the situation by now. Don't try to play games with us if you want things to work out. Stop your tricks and put the lights on in the yards and on the roofs immediately. As for the cops positioning themselves on the roofs, they better not do any bullshit or we'll start slitting throats, I threatened firmly. We're going to put the lights on, the vice commissioner answered, but there aren't any policemen on the roofs. Don't tell lies because that's stupid. And remember that time is running out for the commissioner to get here, I said, laughing to myself. You have only five minutes left. I discussed it with Manolo, and we both agreed to give them some more time. This time, it was Manolo who said in a nasty voice, Listen, son of a bitch, we've moved the deadline to a quarter past seven, but stop messing around. We're not putting it off again. Manolo was considered a dangerous crazy guy in Huesca because of the various fights he'd been involved in while he was in Category A there. This image was so fixed in the screw's minds that throughout the kidnapping, both the hostages and their colleagues insisted through the walkie-talkies that I tried to keep him under control. He really got them into a panic. This was a great advantage because it made our threats more real. But let's get back to where we were at. At seven, they asked us for more time and we gave them until half past. We also freed a hostage, the teacher to be precise. We untied him and let him go to explain the situation. This would have a positive effect for us at a psychological level. The teacher jumped down the stairs three steps at a time. Perhaps he was afraid that we might change our minds about what we'd just done. Following this liberation, they must have thought that it was just one of the usual kidnappings. That played in our favor, as you'll see in a bit. Meantime, they're beginning to play with us. First, they didn't respect the second deadline, and we let them feel satisfied with that. Or at least, we let them stew in their own juice. The commissioner didn't turn up, 
even though I was sure he wouldn't be far away. With every minute that passed, they felt psychologically stronger, seeing that we weren't carrying out our threat. Around half past seven, we decided to show our indignance. We launched a series of insults to the walkie-talkies and let the hostages speak to implore them to get the commissioner to come. That was when they told us that the commissioner's secretary was going to talk to us. Listen, I'm the commissioner's secretary, a flat voice said. Well, what's your dear boss up to, I answered. He's on his way. He's close by when we let him know, he said as an explanation. He's late because of the traffic. What a nerve. Listen to what he's saying. Traffic in Huesca? Then he suggested coming and talking to us. But you must come in alone and stay at the center. We can talk from there, but I repeat, you must come alone, I warned. Not five minutes had passed, and the guy turned up at the center. He must have been little more than 40, and didn't look very much like a secretary. Our discussion was very short. I was sure the commissioner was not far away, and both Manolo and I were beginning to tire of their game. I'm not swallowing that story about the traffic, I greeted him. I can't give you any other explanation because there isn't one, he answered without losing his composure. If you tell me what you want, I can inform him with the telephone in the vehicle that is bringing him here. You listen to me. I said, pronouncing every syllable. The commissioner had better get a move on, because if we don't hear his voice in 15 minutes, we will hand over the first corpse to you. Keep calm. Don't do anything rash, the guy said. Go away, and don't forget to report what you've seen. I dismissed him. But before he went, that guy had the chance to hear Manolo shouting, You should have a boss. It better come soon, my comrade growled. The man claiming to be the secretary finally went, and once he was out of sight, a friend of ours told us that the guy was captain of Huesca Guardia Civil. I immediately called him with the walkie-talkie. Gate, they answered. It's the gate here. What do you want? 